This is going to be another wicked episode, Poku. Well, I follow something called the five golden rules of trading. This way, I don't doubt my analysis because I'm connecting the dots simply uh, the same way every single time. You are getting paid to wait. The market pays you to be disciplined. Be disciplined in every trade, every single time, and the market will reward you. Firstly, if you're listening and not watching to this show right now, a hat, glasses, a whole outfit just came out. So now I have three clues lining up together around the same area and period of time. I can judge that he might be a potential suspect. It's officially the first speculative bubble. Mm. So they were trading options in tulip bulbs. Wow. You have a cutoff rule because it isn't you. It is just something you can't let that obsess in your brain. You can't let your failures define you. When people want to invest, I also tell them to start with their mindset because it's you that affects everything around you. Hello and welcome back to the fourth episode of The Tea Show where it's, it's time to trade thoughts. I can't believe we're on episode number four. I'm getting distracted. Anyway, I'm your tea guy, Gabriel, and sat right next to me. Poku Banks, your other tea guy. Love it. This is going to be another wicked episode, Poku. Who we got coming up? Yeah, like I said, you know, we've got people flying in from across the world. The Lebanese trader, Richard Nazareth, who's taught over 600 students from 30 plus countries, created many trading indicators that can help you with your trading and won many competitions, so his experience is there. It's going to be good to learn from him. Yeah, another top guest. And then straight after him, we're going to have the news with Felicity. As always, what a legend she is. Mm -hmm. And lastly, Izzy Lawrence, who's comedian, an author, a historian, and a pirate expert. We always like to throw something unusual in there, don't we? But she's going to tell us about the history of stocks and how we can learn a little bit about them nowadays. It's going to be a good show. Anyway... It's time to trade thoughts for Rich and Nazar. So here we are with Rich and Nazar, who's taught many students over 600 of that. That's, that's a school. That's, that's, a, that's two schools. There's two schools. Yeah. <laughs> over 30 countries, made many trading indicators which can help you. How are you doing? Doing fantastic. Thank you for having me. Thank you for your trust. And you're looking great. Oh, oh, not bad. Look at the blue suit. <laughs> Start with that. <laughs> blue suit is just is beaming, this is nice. nice. <laughs> but I wanted to ask then, starting with yourself, introduce yourself, what you do, how you trade and whatnot. I'm from Lebanon, from a small city called Biblos. I've been trading for like 10 years, a decade so far, since 2012. And um, I started like everyone whose dream was to be independent and thinking that it's a rich, get rich quick scheme. So, and you know, it hit me hard after a couple of months when you start losing. But um, uh, then I learned many lessons to focus more on risk management, training psychology. I thought that it's only about a strategy that you have to implement it, no matter what. And um, I've been training for 10 years, as mentioned previously, and I've been coaching for seven years or six years. And that's it. And um, what would you say got you into coaching? Like, where, what makes you different and makes you feel like, you know, you can take on all these students? Uh, what truly makes me different is that my trading style is based on RichTL. RichTL is a tool or indicator I developed to solve one problem, subjectivity. Because we all know that if you give two traders the same chart and ask them to each draw a line, a support, a resistance, and so on, you will get two different results because everyone sees the chart differently. And if you don't have a clear and objective way to do your analysis, you will do it differently every time. Thus, you can backtest it, or you can't even trust the backtest result. So you can't use it live as it's not proven to have an edge. So RichTL draws red and blue dots, what I call objective swing highs and swing lows. And I use these dots to make or draw rule-based support resistance, market structure, um, trend lines, patterns, and so on. This way, I don't doubt my analysis because I'm connecting the dots simply uh, the same way every single time. Yeah, and that's really big because even when I'm trading as well, I like to sometimes use a little bit of my gut feeling, a little bit of subjectivity in my trades. So having that objective way, you can then understand and correlate different trades with each other without any, you know, risk of, um, you know, unconventional that type of methods. So in terms of trading, then, 
with Rich TL, would you say once developing that, did that take your training to the next level and keep you being consistent? Of course. Well, I follow something called, what I call, the five golden rules of training. So Rich TL is only one part regarding the technical edge, if you want, or to be objective. Because I don't know if you uh, know about me, I speak four languages. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that technical analysis is a language by itself. So where every candle is a word, every swing is a sentence, and every trend is an overall context. So I'm trying my best to gather as many info as possible to understand what the market is trying to tell me in its own language. And uh, I've got some rules. The first one is, of course, we all know it. The broker says it. Uh, only invest money you can afford to lose. That's a no-brainer. Because if you borrow money to invest, you will get emotional and make irrational mistakes. Rule number two is about risk. So you should risk a small portion of your account, your trade. And uh, enter with fixed risk, not fixed stop loss and pips, not fixed uh, lot size. That's a mistake traders usually make. And uh, you have to remember that all trades should have the same effect or weight on our account. The third rule, which I call the technical edge, to explain this rule, I would like to tell a little story. Mm. Okay, so let's say I'm. I'm Give me an FYI, there are props coming out right now. <laughs> Very exciting. It's interactive. This is story time. One. Okay. okay. Back, relax, and enjoy yeah. the story. Yeah. Enjoy it. <laughs> so, let's say I'm a, I'm a detective, and I have one more tool. And one day they called me that there is a blonde girl who has been murdered in the mm. third floor. Let's say. So I went there immediately, and first thing, I checked her phone. Give me a minute. And that's it. Full gear on. So, um, checked her phone, and saw a message from her neighbor saying that, if you don't silence your dog now, I will do, I can't tell here. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, do you think that that's enough for me to arrest him? Of course not. It's only one clue. So I can't judge uh, over one clue only. So I'm trying to gather as many clues as possible to come up with a conclusion. So I'm looking for clues and so in her hand, there is a black hair and she's blonde. So where's black hair coming from? It might be a girl. It might be the neighbor, right? So it's only still a coincidence. So I went downstairs. There is a shop where has surveillance his cameras. I checked it. And at the time, around the time of the murder, this neighbor was coming out with spots on his shirt. So now I have three clues lining up together around the same area and period of time. I can judge that he might be a potential suspect, right? I can't really judge yet. I should arrest him and inter interrogate him for him to confess that he is the murderer. Mm -hmm. And the exact same logic can be applied to trading, which we call technical edge. So for detectives like me, we gather clues like fingerprints, footage, documents, and so on. For uh, traders, I should remove this one. Uh, we gather clues like uh, supply and resistance, uh, patterns, trend lines, and so on. So we only consider a valid setup at, or a trade once we have three confluences, clues lining up together around the same area. And a trigger, of course, which would be the murderer confessing, right? And uh, if we don't have three confluences, we stay out. Sometimes, no trade is also a trait. So the fourth one rule, which is our second edge, is going to be through risk management by only targeting at least double what we are risking. And um, you have to remember that it's not how many times you win. It's how much you make when you win versus how much you lose when you are wrong. Last but not least, which is our fifth edge, rule number five, is uh, about emotional stability. So if you do, are not feeling well, don't trade. If you have something going on in your life, like exams and college uh, problems at work and so on, simply take the week off. That's a privilege we have in trading. So you don't have to trade every week and you don't have to catch every single trade. Only trade when you are emotionally stable and have a clear mind for you to apply the strategy or trading plan in an objective manner. So in brief, stay away if you don't have these five rules. I, I love that was yeah, yeah. A round of applause. Firstly, if you're listening and not watching to this show right now, 
a hat, glasses, a whole outfit just came out. We had Detective Richard in the studio. It was unbelievable. And I think that what me and Poku, or Poku and I, are learning more and more every day is this science of objectivity when it comes to trading. This idea that the more you can remove emotion and feeling away from it and make rational decisions based on fact and science, the more productive you're going to be as a trader. Exactly. And the kind of, I'm not going to say guaranteed better you're going to perform because obviously that's a different skill altogether, but it's obviously going to work in your favor over the long run. And I think that that's a really good lesson. And those five rules confirm that even more. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the way that you might compare trading to something that someone who's never traded before has no experience doesn't really understand the world of trading. Do you have a nice uh, way that you can kind of put a parallel between two situations to make trading easier to understand? Uh, that's actually my favorite topic uh, because I believe that before you aim to be a good trader, you should start from the core and be a good person. Let me explain. Do you always fasten your seatbelt every time you drive? If not, then you believe that you are too good to make an accident. And hopefully, you will not have an accident. But we both know, one accident can ruin your life. The exact same thing can be applied to trading. Trading without a stop loss is just like driving without a seatbelt. One trade can blow your account. Uh, let me give you one more example. Do you get angry when you lose a game? Do you seek revenge? If yes, then you get even more emotional when you lose a trade because your money is at stake. Yeah, to be fair, when I play a game, um, I don't get angry per se. I like to... I like to go away, find out how I can conquer the game, come back. So I like to take breaks. So. Okay, that, that sounds like an interview answer. That is definitely not the real you. You know, when I lose a game, I take a step back. I na analyze myself. I think about the moves in Monopoly that I could have made differently. Yeah, I feel like you need to be just do strategic yeah. in life and you should transfer these skills to everything you do. I throw the board at the wall and really? run off, yeah. Because I'm, I'm pretty sure you would know revenge trading is bad. So exactly. You know, you're chasing losses. You're now trading in a state of chaos and whatnot. So um, it's definitely good to go away, analyze and just sit back and see. So Exactly. So the manga didn't cause you to have a loss. So if you seek revenge, you're actually seeking revenge against yourself. So, and I would like to compare a little bit, comparison. Uh, Lao Tzu says that the best fighter is never angry. I say the best trader is never angry. I would like to give one more example, which is about patience. So the person should know that if he's patient or not, because 90% of our time as traders is waiting and waiting. First, we wait for the price to approach a key rejection zone, and then we wait for it to form a pattern, and then, wait for the pattern to get activated, and then wait for the trade to reach take profit or stop loss. So you are getting paid to wait. Mm. The market pays you to be disciplined. Be disciplined in every trade, every single time, and the market will reward you. And so I want to dive into that teaching aspect uh, about your career, because how many was it? Six, over yeah, 100 million plus. 30 countries. That's a lot of trust from a lot of people from all around the world, and they must be drawn to something about you. So how did you get into teaching? Why? And like Pokemon asked a bit earlier, why are they choosing you? First of all, I like to share. So it's not about trading only. So if I'm having a meal, I don't like to have it alone. I feel like lonely. So I always invite a friend, invite anyone, anyone even if like a random guy. So he's yeah. sitting alone, would like to share a meal with me. So it's I like to share. And even till date, when I, whenever I meet traders, and I'm glad that you are a trader as well. So uh, I believe that there is always something you can learn. And of course, uh, you have to trust what you do. And it's good to have like a conservative conversation and not let you affect my strategy. And that my strategy, because being objective and being confident about what you do is very important. But at the same time, it's always good to learn from different perspectives. And um, I like to see results. So whenever I share something with someone and see that he's getting somewhere, it motivates me even more to, uh, to keep on doing it. Especially that most of my students are a student who's happy, who brought his brother, his cousin, and so on. So this effect will make you like, feel even more motivated to keep on going. And... Um, I love trading. I didn't want, because at the start, you should have another source of income. Because if you are only relying on trading, no matter how big your account is, 
you will get emotional that I should make this particular amount to pay my bills. And of course, you need to have savings as well. This is what, what I did. So I saved for two years prior for that. I don't need to withdraw from my account for two years. And for example, I spend like 1K per month as an example. So I've saved 24K. So for the next two years, I don't have to uh, get any profit from the market because we all know that it's an average, law of average. So it's like, for example, you make 5% per month, it's on average over one year. And you can't really predict the sequence. So of course, like you have a 50% win rate, but sometimes you might win three out of 10, but sometimes you might win seven out of 10. So it will all average out. So that's why you can't rely on trading very much. You have to have another source of income. That's first. Second, because you don't want to withdraw your profits for, for the compound effect to take place. Because if I have like 10K and make 10, 10K, I withdraw 10K, I'm back to where I started. Mm. And um, that's basically it. Taking a look at the students you have, I mean, we already said the number, over 600, over 30 countries. What is your style of student? Who are the people that are coming to you? And can you kind of share maybe their ages, their backgrounds, their working conditions, you know, their level of wealth? Who are they and what are they? I'm assuming there's all types though. Exactly. So uh, just like the law of average and trading. So this is also uh, uh, is applying on my members. So I've got uh, people from Africa. I've got people from Asia. I've got from the US and Canada and from Europe, a wide uh, range of countries from here. And I started to de develop a pattern just like trading. So. So how you come up with a pattern, you notice it multiple times, and then you backtest it. You backtest it within three phases, like in sample, out of sample, and then forward test it, right? So in sample, that, that's where you noticed it, and then you take another same period of time, and then you validate it. Is this happening? What's supposed to be happening? If yes, then you can forward test it. So I'm now in the out of sample phase for, for these patterns for the students, but um, I started to get a feeling that those between 30 and 40 are usually more aggressive and those who are already like getting close to, to retire are usually more conservative. They want to preserve the capital, but at the same time don't want to go into risky business. But you, but you speak to people of all ranges, age ranges. Um, you said that people in there, what's the oldest student you have and what's the youngest student you have? I've got the oldest one, which is actually someone I coached live because I started coaching live in, in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. And I didn't expect that I would have members from one of the world. So I started coaching live and one of the oldest ones was a friend of mine who has taken my course and his uncle, uh, his uncle loved it. So he's 75. Wow. So he's one of my oldest and I still uh, like talk to him till date. He's very friendly, very pre precise. And most importantly, very con conservative. And I learned a couple of conservative tricks from him. So you learn from your students. Yeah, exactly. I, I always learn. For example, if I am I am attending a cooking class, I always learn something that might relate to trading. How long does it also um, go into? And in terms of trading, man, what brokers do you normally stick to and recommend? So I did some research, and I have set of rules well, to choose a good broker because, especially nowadays. Uh, like you get a lot of uh, fake ones or bad ones. And in my opinion, wherever there is money, there is scammers, right? So it's not only in trading, it's all about all over the internet and in dropshipping and marketing and services and so on. So I have a set of rules and I choose, of course, first of all, I check the reviews because I'm a trader. I want to see other traders, what they say about this service they experience. And then I check where and how, how many regulations does this uh, broker has. The more countries, to me, the better, even though some countries are more important than others or are some regulations, but the more, the better. So it is um, getting clients from all around the world. Third, uh, I always check on the support is in, in how many languages, because I have members from around the world and I always recommend this, this one. So I want every single one of them to be able to uh, like, like be able to communicate with them. And I want them to be happy, right? So I'm, I'm not picking only for myself. It's, it's like my responsibility to recommend a broker. So that's why I dig deeper than any other individual trader.
from doing that research, you came to the conclusion that Tickmill would be the one that makes it. Exactly. The day I shifted from the other broker to Tickmill, it has been five years ago, and, uh, and I've been the only uh, broker I'm, I'm using so far and the only one I recommend as well. It's cool. Convenient. You're on the T-show then, eh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and most importantly that I always like to give examples which is relatable to life, right? Uh, and the same goes for my trading plan. So at some point, every trader should stop learning new stuff, okay? Maybe it might be con contradictory that uh, I'm still running so, so far. But as I mentioned, if you remember, I, I can talk to you in a conservative manner, but don't let you affect my trading plan, right? My strategy. So at some point, you should stop learning new stuff. You are confident of what you have. It is proven to have an edge. You are happy with it according to your time, return, risk appetite, and personality and everything. So you should stick to it and don't look for new strategies. The same goes for, for example, uh, if you are in, in a relationship. I got married and I took the decision like three, four years ago. This is what who I love. This is who I need. Uh, I'm happy with her. I know that I can find better in all aspects from out of the billions of people who are living, right? But I'm done searching. This is who I want. I got married. I'm no longer looking for any other alternatives. For Tickmill, the exact same thing. I'm happy with Tickmill, mm -hmm. so I, I'm not looking for any other. Another question I wanted to ask you uh, was about your outlook going forward. Because you mentioned at a certain age or a certain point, you know, you have a style and you stick with that and that's how you trade going forward. But looking at 2023, the rest of it, 2024 even, what are the things that are exciting you, interesting you, or alternatively scaring you for the market? Very nice question. And I like to answer the second part because I always think in terms of risk and not reward. And I'm really excited. So let's talk about traps or what to avoid. Uh, especially in this bear market, I would certainly avoid catching a falling knife. And by not buying blindly, no matter how cheap or attractive an asset is. Because even if an asset is around a support or even it's all time low, it can, it can still trade lower and lower. So I'll always wait for extra confirmation by waiting for the bulls to at least prove to me that they are strong enough to break a previous high before I buy. I want to also, again, shift gears to do with your background specifically, coming from Lebanon. Yeah. Um, is trading a uh, popular activity out there? The Lebanese community, trading community, is live more than ever and growing very fast. Uh, because lately, a lot of you have heard of it, we had a local financial crisis and um, all of us got their money stuck in the bank. So many people lose their money, or lost their money, or uh, lost even their jobs, right? So the Lebanese started to look for alternative ways to invest and to protect their capital. And trading was a very good option. And uh, s uh, speaking of Lebanon, I would like to offer you a small gesture, a humble one. A bag full of stuff. Right? <laughs> Are we going to get the matching hat that you wore from earlier? No, sorry, that, that's only for the protectors. Yeah. <laughs> Good things are in the bottom. Eh? Good things right at the bottom. This is very exciting. Again, for anyone listening and not watching. Oh, this is for you. And can you give this one to Gabriel? I'm about to. Sure. Poke, do you want to describe what, just, what, what we're looking at here? Oh, what? We're looking for a small mall, right? Uh, written Lebanon on it. And you have the attractive touristic places. Look at this. You used so, to open your box, folks. Oh, my bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to do you. Oh. So next time you drink your coffee, re remember me, right? Oh, wow. <laughs> Beautiful. Do you know what? There's, this is another great item. So this is a small, we've got a small like espresso cup here. Yeah. And with a previous guest as well, he was speaking about risk management. And he said that when you make a decision, a trade or an investment, to remove emotion from it. How can you just put water into your coffee cup? Yeah, let me try it. Cheers. Get a practical feeling <laughs> about it, yeah? But it, he was sharing that one good tip from him is, you know what, step away, go have a coffee, and come back and complete that decision so the decision has all emotion removed from it. And now we've got the coffee cup that we're going to go and use when we go and make that decision. So thank you very much. That's a very kind gift. Glad you like it. Cheers. Absolutely <laughs> wicked. Cheers. Pope, how was your first shot out of it? <laughs> 
it feels good. To, it, it, it tastes nice. You know, it, it gives that feel. <laughs> it gives that feel. No, nah, and talking of um, Lebanon and, you know, internationally, you mentioned how there was a financial crisis then. Did you ever feel like then for yourself that you should start to diversify, you know, where you hold your currencies, especially how you have many students across the world as well. Do you ever feel like, you know, moving to different countries, trading okay. from different places? How how does that work in your life? Okay, so like five years ago, I uh, I have my money all invested. Or I have it, a small portion of it are either gold, physical gold, or in the safe. Mm -hmm. So because I trade all markets and I don't like to store my money or to save it in the bank, I always like to keep it moving. And I trade all markets, as mentioned, I trade, I trade the crypto market, the stock market, and Forex, of course. So, and every market is for, for, for a different purpose. So the crypto market, for example, my crypto holdings are uh, a long-term investment, mainly for my kids. That's how long-term I'm thinking of it. Uh, the stock market uh, and indi indices, of course, the portfolio is for my, my own retirement. So like after 20 years, for example, I can be retired. And uh, forex trading is for monthly and yearly profit. And also coming from Lebanon, is there anything from your culture that you've um, found yourself using in the trading world? Things that you've noticed, especially you teach people from over 30 countries. Do you find things that are unique to your upbringing? I was raised by, by, by a good mother, of course. So uh, I don't know if I can call it for like, like traditional of Lebanese, but uh, yeah, we can. I can relate to, to this, which would be bring us to my previous answer about being a good person. This is a topic, one of my favorite, that you have to be a good person to be able to be a good trader. Mm -hmm. So be patient, be polite, be humble, most importantly, because if you aren't humble, you started forcing the markets and thinking that you know what you are doing, you don't, right? We can't predict, okay? The market is just like chess. So we wait for our opponent, in this case, the market, to make the first move and then react accordingly. We can't really predict multiple games or multiple moves in the beginning. Okay, so that's basically be humble, be patient, be good, uh, be consistent. So a lot of things that's not only applied for trading, whatever business you are starting, you can apply this stuff. And I like that analogy because I also like to say when people want to invest, also tell them to start with their mindset because it's you that affects everything around you. Exactly. So any um business you make or any, you know, um investment you make or any decision you make in your day to day life, it all stems from here. So if here is in turmoil, then everything around you starts to come into turmoil. So it definitely it definitely makes a lot of sense. I think I was gonna say, I think that that's a really nice place to to end it on that note with that line, like be humble, be nice, be good. Yep. Um so I want to say thank you for myself. Definitely. I've learned a lot. It's good to hear step-to-step -step points of how you should become a good trader. Definitely. Cheers for coming on. And thank you for the mugs. Sure, of I course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Next time you drink coffee, remember me, okay? Yes, trade off. Yeah, okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Richard. Another incredible interview. And now we head straight to Felicity, who's going to talk to us about the latest financial topics. <laughs> Hello, Gabriel and Poku. Good to be back with some fascinating topics to chat about today. I'm going to look at why European stocks rose and bond yields cooled last week. Then it's another month, another round of central bank decisions, including the ECB. So we'll look at what they're doing and even more importantly, what those central banks are saying. I'll find out why Nasdaq has taken a $10.5 billion punt on the software provider Adenza, Plus, Germany's economy shrank in the third quarter, putting it at risk of recession. So how come, despite that, it's still set to outperform Japan? There's a lot to look at in today's Hot Topics. We saw some very interesting market moves this week that just show how important it is for investors to follow very closely everything that happens in the US. So in Europe, we saw stocks rise as bond yields finally cooled, and that was after surging for the last few months. And that was happening even before the latest rates decision from the Fed. That's because the US Treasury has slowed down its planned sales of longer term securities, probably in response to those higher yields that we have been seeing in recent months. 
And then when the Fed announced it would hold rates steady for now, US stocks surged, coming back from what was quite a weak October. Now, Jerome Powell didn't rule out another rate hike before the end of the year, but investors seem pretty confident the FTSE 100 and the European stocks climbed even higher after the announcement. They don't seem to think that interest rates are going up in the States for now. Let's stick with central banks, because it's not just the Fed sending out signals in the last few days. A council member at the European Central Bank has made some pretty interesting comments about why he thinks they should keep interest rates at their current levels for at least the next few months. Klaas Knott gave a speech in Amsterdam. He described the current rates as being at a good cruising altitude. Now, Reuters reports he argued for the bank to be patient now and not hike interest rates further to try and avoid damaging the economy. Like most central banks, the ECB has been hiking rates to tackle that very sticky inflation that so many countries are seeing. So it'll be interesting to see if other council members agree. I think maybe it's best to wait and see now if the painful medicine has worked before they decide whether or not to dose the patient some more. Here in the UK, the Bank of England didn't surprise investors. There was no hike, as expected. It kept its benchmark rate steady at five and a quarter percent. Now, it may also be wondering if that's a good cruising altitude. But here in the UK, inflation is still pretty high compared to other major economies. And that's despite a slowdown in growth. In fact, the bank warned there is now a 50-50 chance of recession by the middle of next year. The company Nasdaq says its latest acquisition is an important milestone in its ongoing transformation. It's bought the software firm Adenza for $10.5 billion, its biggest acquisition ever. Now, adding Adenza means it can offer risk management, regulatory reporting and capital market software to the financial services industry. Essentially, Nasdaq is the second biggest stock exchange in the US, but it wants to grow its services as a fintech company and become part of the fabric of the financial system. And its plan is that this will mean it can sell more ongoing services to its existing customers. And that creates a more stable revenue, one that doesn't rely on the mood of the markets to make money. Well, finally, let's talk about Germany, the largest economy in Europe. Its latest GDP data shows the economy shrank slightly in the third quarter, dropping 0.1% compared to the 0.1% it grew by in quarter two. Now, that's being driven by a fall in consumer spending. But there was also some more worrying data that followed. The number of unemployed people rose and the number of vacancies fell in October. So we can already see the slowing economy is causing businesses to rein back their spending, rein back their recruitment. But despite this, something really interesting is happening. Economically, Germany is projected to overtake Japan as the third largest in the world, if the International Monetary Fund is right. It's predicting that Germany's GDP will be about $4.43 trillion this year, compared to 4.23 for Japan. But if Germany's teetering on the brink of recession, what could possibly be going on? Well, the answer is the yen is almost where it was a year ago, close to a 33-year low against the dollar. Now, that's partly because of the different central bank decisions. As we've already been discussing, the Fed, the ECB, they've hiked interest rates to try and get control of inflation. The Bank of Japan has been working instead to stimulate economic growth. Two very different economies, two very different approaches. It's going to be fascinating to see if the IMF is right and that even if Germany ends the year in recession, it might still end up being larger than Japan. Poku, Gabriel, from a tale of two economies to a tale of two tea guys. It's back to you in the studio. Thank you so much, Felicity, sharing with us the latest financial news. And now our next guest, Izzy Lawrence, joins us. Now, you are a comedian, an author, historic expert. Yeah. And someone that studies and knows pirates really, really well. That is true. I do know pirates quite well. Excellent. Yeah. I know that people are sitting there thinking, isn't this like a finance and trading show? What is going on? But we'll get there. I promise. There'll be a link. It might be tenuous, but we'll make sure that it works out <laughs> for the day. But... I want to kick it off with just learning a bit more about you and your story and how you got all of those accolades to your introduction. Well, I'm an academic nerd, is basically me. I actually got my degrees, my background's a science degree, but that science is geography. So, you know. That counts. 
advanced colouring in still counts. So I did a degree in geography, which allowed me to do a lot of, you know, I had to do a whole, you know, exam on statistics and, you know, three hours. That was a lot and excellent at really old school programming. Uh, I know, exactly. Um, but yeah, so I basically went into stand up comedy. And if you're in stand up comedy, you know, as in any entrepreneurial business, you need to find your niche. And my niche turned out to be history. And that was entirely accidental because I was reading loads of history books because I loved them. I love them. You could have studied history. It was, I could have studied history, but yeah, it was a bit late at that point. And I think I wouldn't have loved it if I'd studied it in that sense. So a lot of my degree was historical, you know, background, looking into the historical record of different things. But ultimately, I don't have a history degree. I have a geography degree. However, that didn't stop me from doing, you know, comedy shows about history. I did a show called The Zedless Deadlist, which the British Museum picked up and does live shows with. And then because I was on, you know, regularly at the British Museum, I did their podcast and I also got picked up by BBC Radio 4. Um, so I know you have to say it like that. You can't say Radio 4. You've got to say Radio 4. You know, very posh, very intellectual. I never knew there was a distinguishable difference. And so I worked with them and BBC Worldwide, making documentaries, making history shows like Making History. But at the same time, I was still doing comedy. So I've got a, a show called Your Place or Mine on the BBC as well, which goes out on Saturday mornings on Radio 4. So that is... That is my background. That's the Whistle Stops tour. Yeah, not it's it's a weird one. It's pretty impressive, I have to say. I found my niche, but I'm not a trader. I am an investor, but I am not a trader. Well, you've got knowledge. I have knowledge. On the subject. Oh, yeah. Especially about the historic version of the subject. And there's the link. There is the link. Why we have you sitting here today and why you're on this specific show. Yeah. I mean, Poku's been asking me a lot of questions historically about trading, haven't you? Yeah, 100%. Um... But I haven't been able to answer any of them. Yeah, I would love to know just, you know, where it comes from. And I want you to explain it in a way that can make me laugh. <laughs> oh, it makes you laugh. Oh, that's the... I mean, trying to explain it in a way that, you know, normal people can understand is hard enough. I mean, the first official stock exchange start of the 17th century, I think it was 1611, was the Dutch East India Company basically trading stock and trying to build up a lot of wealth within Holland. Because the thing about the Netherlands is it's not very big. It's not a big political power. And still it starts going to... Um, you know, the East and picking up loads of spices and bringing it back to Holland and then they're making money. When they make money, they need to buy ships, they need to get out there and to do this, they have a little mini stock exchange starting. And it's quite a famous one as well. Have you heard, either of you, about tulip mania? No. You haven't? Yes. <laughs> yes. But I know nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> what, so not the flower... Yeah, the flower, oh, the flower, the actual flower. There were... you've, got, you've got more knowledge than you think. Exactly. Yeah. Like, maybe you should explain yeah. this one. <laughs> Mania, so there was, I guess, there was a flower that everybody liked and everyone crazy of it. Exactly. A oh. bit like, you know, um, it was a spec it's officially the first speculative bubble. Mm. So they were trading options in tulip bulbs. Wow. Which is... When, when are we talking? We are talking, well, 1636 is when the it gets ridiculous. Okay. And we're talking, you can trade a single tulip bulb for a house. So there are there's tulip bulbs, I think in um, 1637 in like February, there's one tulip bulb which sold for um, 5,300 um, gelder or 5,200 gelder. And considering that a carpenter, skilled trade at that time annually will earn about 250 gelder. You can imagine, you know. Right. And this is, this is, it seems crazy to us. And, you know, there's this big thing in our society where this is seen as the first big speculative bubble. You have people, so what they're doing is they're trading promissory notes. Mm. So if you've got to imagine, you want your tulips. You want your tulips because you're Dutch and there's very little you can buy to show your wealth mm. because you're Calvinist. Now, Calvinists are very Puritan. They all wear black and white. You're not allowed to be ostentatious in any way you're allowed to be if you like like jazzy stuff so if you wanted to like show off you wouldn't get yourself a nice mercedes or anything like that or a tesla or whatever you would get yourself a really decent portrait you know of your family looking very somber and serious we're talking like van gogh kind of era exactly that sort of thing it's all clicking exactly where he made his money before he lost it all again and then made it all again but um point is tulips was something that only the wealthy could really take pride in because you had to be a good gardener, you had to have knowledge. They were only flower for like, you know, a few, like six weeks a year. You know, this is, you know, the time to buy them. 
and they were really, really rare ones. So they'd been brought over to Holland like in the mid, like 16th century, sort of you know, 1520 sort of time, and then they started to be developed. And so you'd get these ones with stripes. Now we know that, that the stripes ones, mm. those are down to a, a, vi a virus, this mosaic virus that tulips can get, which means they can't produce many bulbs, right? And that means that they're really rare. So they've got this natural rarity to them. And they're really pretty because they're stripy. And you don't know exactly which ones are going to be the most stripy and the most, you know, oh, they're collectible. They're really collectible. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking Beanie Babies Plus here. This is like actual, actual rarity. And so people went crazy for these and wanted to, you know, get these. But the only way to get them was in this really short time in the market. So you've got this really short time where, you know, Oh, look, you can see the parent bulbs. You can see that they've got flowers. You can have a guess what the kids' bulbs are going to be like. And that's the only time you can buy those bulbs, those kid bulbs, until somebody said, well, how about we start a futures market? So how about we say, well, I will, um, you know, basically a stock option. I will buy your tulip bulbs um, basically a year from now. I'll put down 10% and then you give me first option and, you know, that price. And then somebody goes, oh, you're going to buy them for that much. I'll give you that much for that bit of paper saying the IOU. I'll give you that much for that bit of paper saying the IOU. And you had this chain of people all buying the same tulip bulb. And of course, that's great until February when nobody wants to buy the actual bulb. And they just quit on their option. Yeah. So they lose their deposit, they quit on their option, and the entire thing just goes, oh, collapse. Exactly. Now, in the like in our sort of general idea of it, what happened was everybody jumped in the canal. They went made bankrupt and rudder rudder. Yeah, you know, that's 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 the understanding. A story for another time. Maybe. Well, no, no, but that didn't happen. Ah, because I mean, basically, it got regulated. So the government stepped in and the court stepped in and said these are promissory notes. These are not real money. So nobody actually was made bankrupt. There's this um, historian called Al um, Anne Golgar who basically went through it all, found out that the chains that everybody thought were like hundreds and hundreds, massive speculations, only five people long max. And so it didn't actually create this terrible financial crisis in Holland. A lot of people think it did, but it didn't. It was literally, and you know, some people say it wasn't even a bubble. The reason that it popped was because over this time, as the tulips of, you know, people found out they were getting more and more expensive, more and more people started to grow them. And in February, when the bubble popped, that's when tulips in Harlem started to flower. So there was an oversupply. This is a supply and demand issue, not a speculative bubble. And I just thought for the nerds who know about tulip mania, they'd like to know that technically wasn't a futures market collapsing. Whoa, I feel like you need to compress that story a little bit. Foku, are you having like flashes of your current trading life and thinking to yourself, this could have been so much easier if I lived in Holland in the 1700s? Yeah, no, I've um, I got, I got, I got hay fever. So oh, yeah, no. Yeah, that I feel like I wouldn't be interested. But I mean, I can see somebody, you know, just getting it just to say, oh, yeah, this is a show of my wealth and whatnot, especially with the straps as well. But even with the virus, was the virus just for tulips only? So it weren't like... Yeah, yeah, you couldn't catch, oh, get sick of oh, tulips. Yes, but, you. And now, you see, back then, the virus didn't really affect the tulips as much, but now striped tulips, they're much shorter, they're much weaker than they were. So mosaic virus, you know, tulips back in the day were better. Shifting us a little bit more towards your career. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of the things that we're, we're doing here is trying to teach, like, the personalities, and, mm. you know, the psychology, not just the practical skills. And being a comedian... Mm. It's a lot about making light of difficult scenarios and, you know, lows. And I'd love to know some advice, some things that you share to people who maybe have had bad experiences, struggles, potentially financially. How do you make light of those tough, tough times? Well, there's, there's a rule in comedy which goes around, which is particularly if you're a comedian, right, and you're up there and it's just you and the audience hates you. That happens occasionally. Not to me anymore, thank goodness. But particularly when you're starting out and you're not sure what's going on, and you're distracted and you're trying to remember a thing and something happens, it's, you can get audiences just there going, what are you doing with your life? <laughs> and that can, that can hurt quite a lot, but it's important that you learn from that. And it's important that you learn where you went wrong. Some people even record and listen back so they can really hear, oh, that's where I lost it because I stumbled that line and I did a call back to something I didn't say, you know, all of these basic things that, you know, because you're in a panic because you're up there, you don't know. So I think it's very important that you go back and learn from your mistakes and rationally, you don't beat yourself up about it, you just learn from it. But also, there's this rule in comedy, which is you do not do that past midnight the same night of the gig. 
you have a cutoff rule because it isn't you. It is just something. You can't let that obsess in your brain. You can't let your failures define you. You can't let that revisit you. So you just have a rule saying, I can be as upset as I want about this. I can weep about it if I need to. Like, say you just lost a lot of money. But like, oh no, I just lost a lot of money. I'm so stupid, blah, blah, blah. You're only allowed to do that up until a certain cutoff time. And anything beyond that is a waste of time. It's happened. Just get, you know, literally get over it, but just stop beating yourself up about it. Because going back to the same problem and ruminating is really negative, And that's going to really affect your performance in the future. So I think you can definitely stay, you know, keep that as a trade. And also know that particularly, you know, retail traders and day traders and it's a really hard, tough thing that you're trying to do. It's not easy. And to accept that failure is going to be part of that, I think is really healthy. And you are worth more than your financial worth. As a human being, you're worth something. So if you lose everything, you're still a valuable person that people will love. I think that's really important. But um, moving forward, like, you know, not the past, but now the future now, you know, obviously the rise of AI, mm. you know, obviously you, you know, you're on stage, you're, you're making videos, but you know, there's things and um, applications that can be made where I'm pretty sure you've seen deep fakes. Oh yeah. So people can even take what you've said out of context and try to even counsel you. So what do you think about that going forward and how that affects you and your career? Well, I mean, for me in my career, it means anybody can rip my voice off and say that I said anything. But I don't really, I, I don't, I don't mind if I don't actually, if 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 somebody makes an AI of me saying something awful, but I didn't say it, I don't feel too bad because I didn't say it. Um, because you can't control what other people think of you. Full stop. And also, I think there's a, I did a show for BBC Worldwide about um, AI and deep fakes and stuff, and you really can't tell sometimes. So I think it's a case of, you know, if I'm reading the news or something and something just seems really off about something if the thing's coming up on my social media feed and it just seems that can't be right I definitely do question it and I go in further before responding before sharing just take that little bit of time because you could start you know John Blunt would do so well here he'd be able to say South Sea oh we've we found this magical treasure island it's incredible oh get in now you know make sure you sell (laughs) and I think a lot of people you know how easy is it to get influencers just to, you know, you know, send a message out on social media. I mean, look at GME, GameStop, when, <laughs> when um, um, you know, Musk tweeted GameStop, it skyrocketed. Mm-hmm. It absolutely skyrocketed. Yeah. And that is entirely down. And people caught out when they stopped, you know, being able to buy more shares. They were completely caught out and they suffered the drop. So you've got to be savvy. Don't really have your strategy stick to your strategy and don't let outside influences panic you into making a mistake that goes against your core principles i think would be my main um thing with ai and stuff that's a brilliant takeaway i mean you're seeing it more and more um i think even the martin lewis money saving experts had deep fakes of him yeah. giving out financial advice and what you said there about you know if it seems a little bit off take a pause especially in this financial world the industry especially what we're talking about in every single show People are really there to take advantage of you. Whenever money's involved, there are going to be bad players in the game. So taking that pause, if it doesn't feel right, really step away and have a think about it. Have your coffee from the mug that we got earlier. Is it gone? <laughs> and then come back and make a rational decision or ask for help and, and, and for advice uh, from people that you do trust. Because yeah. there should be at least one, right? There should be. And, you know, and also, like, for me, as, as somebody who just does, you know, I do good old Warren Buffett index funds. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that's the thing. I'm very, very, you know, I'm very I love safe. that. <laughs> good old Warren Buffett index. <laughs> well, that's what he recommends. He might not do it himself professionally, but it's what he recommends. He says, these are the way that, you know, ride the storm, you know, mm. just if, you know, say, you know, the S&P 500 does crash tomorrow, I know what I'm doing, which is I'm just sitting in it. I'm losing all the money and then hopefully it'll come back again because it usually does. Mm. And I think... If I start making decisions I don't understand, that is where the danger lies. Any financial decision. If I don't understand it, I don't do it. I think that is an absolutely brilliant sentence to end on. So I want to say thank you for myself. Thank you again. No worries. It's It's been a pleasure. Yeah, you made me laugh as well. Oh, (laughs) dear. That was the one challenge he gave you at the start, wasn't it? (laughs) Tell me the story and make me laugh. I know. know. Sorry for like prodding you with a stick. That's that's (laughs) fine. That's fine. (laughs) No, thanks so much for joining us. Thank and you. I hope everyone enjoyed. Poku, 
episode four, done and dusted. Another insane show. We learned so much, but specifically from Richard, what did you get? From Richard, I learned a lot, you know, from his five golden rules. I learned a lot about his risk management strategies. And it just helps when I see someone successful, how they put into practice. And the fact that, you know, he finds it boring, it should be a completed system to get yourself to wealth. So having that reassured to me, it really helped. I learned a lot. Moving on, though, you know, from Izzy, what did you learn from the stories and the comedic laugh that I got from it? Me, what didn't I learn from Izzy? Firstly, I learned that someone can make you laugh, which is huge. But do you know what? It's just so fascinating to see how far back this stuff goes because I'm quite new to trading. I know that you've got experience, but to see the history, it goes back all the way that we were talking about stories from the 1600s, the 1700s. It's just fascinating to know that these systems repeat themselves again and again and there are so many practices that you can take from history so that might be you know a good a good place to start if you're an inexperienced trader take a look at the history you know understand that a little bit and that will help you looking forward to the future although we always do say historic returns are not a guarantee of future results right. but either way there's definitely something to learn but yeah an incredible show and then we've got another episode next week don't we 100 percent, and that starts off with our bright man who's a mystery guest who would definitely be flying in from a mystery country. Then get John Fury, you know, the father of Tyson Fury and also Tommy Fury. So he's going to talk to us about you know, raising a winning mentality within his family, which would be very, very useful for sure. And he's going to help me on my upper hook. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's going to be a great one. Anyways, we'll see you in two weeks where it's time to trade thoughts with Tyson Fury.